And we continue with our Kevin Dorn interview series today on the Newsmaker Show. This one from July 29th, 1987. It's Kevin Dorn and Allegheny County historian Craig Brock. Craig Brock, our guest this morning, is the Allegheny County historian. We were off on a topic of uh, architecture in our area, oh, a few months ago. and then Quite a few months ago. Yeah, we got <laughs> off track because Craig was off on a tour of Civil War battlegrounds. The next thing we knew, we were talking about the Civil War, and we kind of forgot about the architecture. Let's get back to that today, Craig, shall we? All right, very good. Uh, we left off. Uh, we had covered the one of the major interesting styles of the Victorian era. And we left off, uh, believe it or not, Kevin, we talked about this back in uh, March. And we haven't done anything since then. We've talked Civil War since then. And we can, we can fight Civil War again next month or the month after or whatever. So the one style of the Victorian era, and uh, just to reiterate and refresh our memories, we talked that nobody ever built a Victorian house. You built a house in the Victorian era in a number of different styles. You had several different styles to choose from, and one particular style is called the mansard, or commonly known as Second Empire style. And you've wait, got wait, why Second Empire? That I don't know. Intrigues me. I do not know. Sounds like something out it's of Star a, Wars. It's of a, a French origin or a French convention, if you will. And uh, why I'm talking about this in particular is because two or three nights ago in the paper, the uh, Hornell Chamber of Commerce building was going to be touched up, uh, remodeled, modernized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I that, that that could be very interesting, and that's right across the street from Friendly's, and right there, and that is the Mansard style, and it's a beautiful, beautiful house. Uh, the origin, and I think we talked about this, it was a French style, in that you were taxed in France in the 1850s and so on, on the number of floors below the roof line. And so some very clever, enterprising individual over there decided to make a very steep angle roof line, 80, almost 85 degrees, but still call it his roof line, and therefore opening up a second floor of his house, which otherwise is uninhabitable. And instead of putting uh, standard horizontal siding boards on this second floor. He put the fish scale or roof shingles on it that is on the uh, Chamber of Commerce building here. And so the tax man came around and said, uh, well, I see Mr. Doran here, for example, you are living in a house that now has two floors. And you say, Mr. Doran is a very sharp individual, and you say, whoa, wait a minute, Mr. Tax Man. Uh, your law says a number of floors below the roof line. You take a look at my house, and that is still an angled roof line, and instead of... Uh, horizontal siding, I've got roof shingles for my siding. That's the roof line right of course, there. All this would have had to be, uh, would have to have been in French because yes, I was in French. Yes, yes. Yeah. You speak fluent French, no yeah, doubt. Absolutely. Given, and I'll bet, you the, I'll bet you the government took, oh, in the area of 20 to 30 minutes to change That's the law. That's just about correct. Yeah. But there was enough of the houses built before they could reenact new laws. I don't think they had the bureaucratic red tape to encounter we have today. L but, let me pause for a moment just to tell you that the new tax law in this country, uh, if you thought, you know, it was going to help you, then I hope you'll join us, I think it's next week when uh, Janet Atkins is out of H&R Block to tell you about all the new ways they have oh, to get your money away I, from I you. could just hear her howling over yeah. something like that, yeah. of course. So I, I just thought I'd mention yep. that. Go ahead. And so uh, the style caught on, and when the uh, French immigration began in our country, of course, they brought their culture with them. They could bring very, very few physical artifacts with them, but they brought their culture with them, and the style caught on here during that 50-year period that we call the Victorian era, from about 1840, 1850, running up to very close to 1900. Then the ne next major style in the Victorian era, we have uh, do not have any examples of in this area. We, there's one house over in Bath uh, in this particular style, and that's called cobblestone. And when you think of uh, the old English movies where the very romantic scene, the horses go clip-clopping down the street and so on, they're walking on cobblestones. And they are found in our area, a very narrow, long band along the south shore of Lake Ontario. 
uh, extending, going uh, east to west, starting at Niagara County, Orleans County. No, I'm going west to east, sorry. West to east, Niagara County, Orleans, Monroe, uh, Wayne, uh, and then uh, Oswego County, and then over to Jefferson County. And no more further south than about Geneva or Canandaigua, maybe 30, 40 miles south, and maybe 150, 200 miles long. And these were glacially deposited. When the glaciers came from the north 10, 15, 20,000 years ago, they would pick up debris, the top several feet perhaps of some, in some cases of topsoil. And it would be like a gigantic dryer. Uh, and that the material be pummeled over and over and over and turned over and over like you're closing a dryer in this uh, ice sheet. And as the ice would then later melted and as it moved north, it would drop right there whenever the material came to the surface. And it happened to drop these layers of cobblestones, started out as huge tremendously irregular shaped stones and they wound up being about the size of a small loaf of bread or a softball or a baseball and relatively round. And they were used, incorporated into the exteriors of the houses from about 1830 to about 1880 along the south shore of Lake Ontario. Out of curiosity, uh, we know what the Mansard uh, reason was. There was a tax reason for that style of tax architecture. Tax for that, that's correct. What would be the advantages of the cobblestone uh, right, there was around uh, Lake Ontario. There were several advantages. Number one was that if it cleared the farmer's land of those pain in the neck stones, and it became a functional utilitarian reason. And uh, they used the indigenous materials right there at hand. They didn't have to import fancy uh, exterior products and so on that cost a lot of money. They didn't have the physical means or the money to import fancy products and so on. So they took advantage of what was right there. The cobblestones really did not serve a useful purpose in the house per se because the foundation was there. They built that a regular foundation and they had a regular frame, wood frame house. So they simply then added mortar to the outside and inserted the stones only as a facade, as a decoration, if you will. The, the cobblestones can be taken away from the house, and the house is not going to be altered uh, functionally in any way, shape, manner, or form. It just simply served as a sign or as a symbol to you, the passerby, that, hey, look at me, I've got a new house, I can afford it, and you can't. It's a status symbol. It's just as simple as that and nothing more. Now that you mention it, I can think of a lot of those houses up around Rochester. Now, sure. Now that you've They're mentioned right, it. Right along Ridge Road, State I, Route 104. Right, and um, that was a status symbol. Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. And we're going to get into the next style of status symbols after we, after take, this we break. take a break. Right. You got it. Right. You are Medicine Primary Care in Hornell is pleased to introduce Dr. Joanne Nazareth to our community. Dr. Nazareth is an internal medicine doctor with an interest in chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension. Her goal is to help patients enjoy the best quality of life. Dr. Nazareth is now accepting new adult patients at 7309 Seneca Road in Hornell. To learn more, call 607-385-3700 or visit doctor.urmc.edu slash Hornell. And before we get back to our 1987 Newsmaker Show with Kevin Doran and Allegheny County historian Craig Brock, let's check the forecast with Rob. Good morning. Well, good morning, Brian. Uh, what's up? The sun's up, though we really can't see it. A lot of cloudiness out there this morning, and we've got a little bit of light snow headed our way as we close out 2019. Brian, it looks like uh, temperatures are going to be cool today and tomorrow, but milder weather's in store for the region. Could be pushing 50 degrees by as early as Thursday and maybe get temperatures above 50 on Friday with a little bit of rainfall. Today, though, it's going to be chilly. Lots of cloudiness. We'll see some occasional light snow breaking out as the day goes on. Up to an inch may fall by evening. High temperatures today are going to be close to 40. Sunrise, uh, sunrise on this final day of the year was at 739. Sun's going to set this evening at 448. Now for New Year's Eve tonight, if you're headed out, be careful. There'll be a few flurries and snow. No showers around. There could be a couple of slick spots overnight. Lows falling back to 25 to 30. New Year's Day looks partly to mostly cloudy. May see a few peaks of sunshine. Temperatures tomorrow on the order of 35 to 40 degrees. Tomorrow night, partly cloudy, 25 to 30. As we all head back to work on Thursday, we'll do so with partial sun overhead and a high of 45 to 50. Showers and close to 50 degrees on Friday, Brian. 
We're talking with uh, Craig Brock. He's the Allegheny County historian. We're picking up a, a, a topic that we left for a while back in March because we got talking about civil war. I'm not sure I know why. I guess because you were going on a trip. I was going on a trip. And that, that got us going. Then you came back from the trip and we kept that discussion going. Now we're back to the uh, architecture of our area, of our area, and we're in the Victorian era. You've mentioned uh, two now so far today. Okay. Let's move well, on. All right. The next major style is the Italianate, or commonly called Italian villa. And just the same way as the French immigrants brought their culture, brought their style of houses with them, the Italians did the same thing in the mid and late 1800s. And you just look at it from this perspective, and I think we said this before many months ago, that if you were to pick up and move to Wisconsin, Montana, any place, I don't care. The fact is that you're moving, you can't take too many things with you, especially in the old days where you would take five or six members of your family in the equivalent of a modern-day large van, uh, uh, a Chevy van or a Plymouth van, not a moving van, but a, a, a four-wheel van, and that how many things can you take with you and provisions for two months traveling on the road? Not too much. But most important, you can take your culture and what you are used to doing, you can take that with you. And you pick up your lifestyle, more or less, wherever you move, the same lifestyle that you left. You are predictable, we are creatures of habit, we're human beings. And so, you would look for the same type of organizations to join, the same churches, social, fraternal, civic groups, the same job, live in the same kind of neighborhood, have the same kind of friends, look for more or less the same kind of job, and so on. So the, uh, the same thing happened many, many years ago. So when the Italians came over, they brought their styles with them of architecture. Obviously, they could not afford the big, beautiful houses they may have left, so they reduced them and modified them tremendously. The best example of the Italian villas is when you watch Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous on TV with Robin Leach as a uh, disgusting voice. I, this just reminds me of fingernails on a blackboard. Anyway, he can't help his voice, I guess. So, the many of the segments on that TV show are filmed along the Italian resort areas in the Mediterranean in these beautiful mansions or villas. And that's basically the style that was brought over and modified to fit the area here in the mid to late 1800s. And the Italians basically went back to the Georgian or federal styles a little bit in that they were rather square or boxy or rectangle looking, but they altered the roof line tremendously. The federal or Georgians had this straight roof line from one end of the house to the other. The Italianate style was just picture it as a flat roof and then somebody reaching down from above and pulling the center of the roof right straight up about 10-15 feet. In other words, all four corners leading to a point in the center. Just like pitching a tent where you put the center stake up and the rest, it comes like a point right to the center of the roof line. That's Italianate style. And you've got um, many examples of Italianate houses here in Hornell. Also, they put a very wide, uh, the roof line extended over the house, anywhere from two to three to four feet, almost like an um, umbrella affair. And ex ex excellent examples of Italianate architecture, very simply, is a very fancy design, extremely fancy, much more so than the common Italian houses. The fanciest one in our area is the castle in Canisteo. That's a spectacular Italian name. Uh, without a doubt, and probably not too many people in Hornell area have seen it. I'm sure they've heard of the house, but it's worth a drive to Wellsville in its own right, and it's one of the finest examples of Italian architecture in the country, and that is the famous Pink House in Wellsville. There's a college architectural textbook that has the Pink House featured prominently on its cover. It's that fabulous a uh, house, and it's just un unparalleled in our eastern United States for the most part. Uh, a more modified or common examples of Italianate houses in our area is an uh, excellent house in Elmond right across the street from Stewart's Pools, and that's where the Lindemann house is right now. Uh, excellent example of Italianate has the cupola on it, or we sometimes commonly call the widow's walk, and that's the first time we see that. And that distinguishes 
the style of the house by itself. The Widow's Walk at Cupola really had no particular function because it was either too cold or too hot to live up there. But it served to say, I have a new house that's different style than yours. I can afford it, and you can't. Again, it's a status symbol, Kevin, as simple as that. <laughs> Absolutely. You have all these people sitting there saying, Aha, I have a new house, and you don't. Do you think they really did that? In the, or did they just build a house? They, they, uh, it, it was a, a tacit form. It was not an overt act. Obviously, yeah. they didn't say it. They may perhaps have said it if they were really snobbish. But it was a quiet, subtle reminder that I live in the new suburbs, the good part of town, and so on. There is one beautiful uh, cupola on a house. It's on Center Street. You can see it right maybe two or three doors uh, down from Pizza Hut going towards... Uh, Loader Street. You can see it very good from the overpass over the tracks behind the fire station right now. It has no real function, does it? Absolutely not. And the problem is, you probably had dozens and dozens of cupolas in Hornell. I can remember them, yeah. Mm -hmm. But they're the weak link in the chain of keeping the house waterproof, if you will, in the fact that they were always leak, and when somebody else bought the house, it changed hands they didn't have the romantic feeling, they didn't have any cognition of historical value, and off it came and they would patch it so the roof wouldn't leak. And you altered many, many a beautiful house that way. Other excellent examples, uh, right there near Friendly's Restaurant, of course, is Robinson's Motel. That's a very much reduced Italian architecture. Across the street is Williams Inn. That is a gorgeous example of Italian architecture. The roof line comes to a nice peak in the center. The eaves extend three or four feet over the rest of the house. That's the science of Italians. 252 Main Street is Winter's Real Estate Office. Beautiful example of Italian. Uh, Joe Pelch's office at 211 Main Street. And I don't know who lived at the following numbers, but I saw the numbers in the houses when I was when I drove Main Street. 223 and 231 Main Street are both excellent examples of Italianate or Italian villa. Uh, beautiful brackets underneath this eave sticking out is also Italianate. And these brackets serve no function. You can remove the brackets from the roof line, and the roof line is not going to fall off. They're simply there in aesthetic addition. Uh, our studio at 234 has beautiful brackets. That whole street, an excellent And example. probably you would find that many of those places were built by the same people. Oh, absolutely. Same firm. Abs same architectural firm. Uh, mm -hmm. country. Absolutely. It's the same analogy that I use here to when I talk to school kids. It's the same analogy as how do you tell the age of a tree when you cut it down? You can you see the rings. And just picture this. Usually the oldest part of any good sized settlement is the downtown area. And with each succeeding generation, you have your rings around that downtown oldest area, and then the suburbs grew. So the oldest part of Hornell is obviously the business area where the in the hub of the wheel, and then you had your first residences established on the near end of Main Street, and then as you get out into suburbs, North Hornell, obviously your houses get newer and newer, and you can spot it in every place you go. So if you want to find the oldest part, you head downtown. Simple as that. Craig, we've only got about a minute. What's the other style? Okay, the last of the pure distinctive styles by itself is called Queen Anne. And I don't know why it's named Queen Anne. Maybe we'll make that my assignment to, for me to research for next time. We've got some beautiful examples. I don't want to get into the distinctive styles of it, but uh, the Queen Anne style was 1880 to about 1910. And since then, there's been no really pure, beautiful, distinctive style. The, most of the houses have been very simple, mundane, bland, if you will, one story ranch house or one two-story split-level ranch that we now commonly call a splanch, and I kind of like that one. Uh, basically, the, the Queen Anne was the last of the Victorians, the last of the distinctive styles, and that's it for architecture. We'll talk Quickly, Queen Anne well, next get, time. Give us a, a, a house in Hornell that's uh, Queen Anne. Uh, we'll pass. We'll do it next month. Oh, How's that sound? to wait that long. All right, very good. Craig Brock, our guest this morning. Allegheny County historian. Tomorrow, Lori Castellan will be with us. Lori, of course, was the coach at Hornell High School for many, many years. There'll be a testimonial dinner this weekend honoring him. We want to talk to him tomorrow about his 
recollections of coaching and Hornell. Friday, Robert Morris will be with us all on the Newsmaker program. 9 o'clock, news is next from ABC, WLEA, Hornell. Great show. Uh, Kevin had a great report with a lot of the guests, including uh, Allegheny County historian uh, Robert Brock again from uh, July 29, 1987. Let's uh, keep going with ABC News from that day. And a familiar voice to many, the now retired Doug Limerick. From ABC News, I'm Doug Limerick. It's been more than a year since the world's worst nuclear power plant accident at Chernobyl. Now a Soviet court has convicted six men in connection with that disaster. Details maybe sees Barry Dunsmore in Moscow. To no one's surprise here in Moscow, six former officials and technicians at the Chernobyl nuclear plant have been found guilty of gross violations of safety rules and sentenced to terms of up to 10 years in a labor camp. The verdict thus conforms to the official Soviet view that the accident was entirely due to human error. Among those convicted were the former plant director, the chief engineer, and his assistant. The defendants had initially accepted only partial blame for the incident, so the only real question about the verdict was whether the judge would find that any higher-ups or the system itself might also be to blame. Evidently, he did not. Barry Dunsmore, ABC News, Moscow. I'll have more news after this. Know someone who faces the jungle every day? Send an FTD pick-me-up bouquet to your best friend who got up on the wrong side of the treehouse this morning. To your wife who had to fight the rush hour stampede. Or to your sister who was called into the king of the jungle's office. You can soothe the beast and anyone who's had a bad day with an FTD pick-me-up bouquet. It's bright flowers, rainbow coffee mug, and tote bag will make them feel like a top banana. And only your FTD florist has it. The Subaru Value Celebration, the greatest deals in Subaru. We've got a better Subaru commercial. Take delivery on select Subaru models from dealer inventory by August 3rd and get up to $1,500 cash back. Or now, 3.9 financing. Dealer participation may affect final price. That's 3.9 annual percentage rate financing for 24 months to qualified buyers through Marine Midland Automotive Financial Corporation on select Subaru models at participating dealers. Up to $1,500 back or 3.9 financing on a Subaru. How's that for a commercial? The Soviets have presented a new arms control proposal dealing with space weapons at the arms negotiations in Geneva. A Soviet official says his government does not want the U.S. to ban Star Wars altogether, but it does want both sides to abide by the anti-ballistic missile treaty for 10 years. The U.S. has maintained that Star Wars research is not a violation of the ABM treaty. As for the Soviet proposal to eliminate all intermediate-range nuclear missiles, the Soviets say the U.S. must also get rid of about 70 Pershing missiles based in West Germany. The supertanker Bridgeton now reported to be taking on crude oil, getting ready to make another trip down the Persian Gulf. ABC's David Ensor says the return voyage through the Gulf should take longer than the trip to Kuwait. The uh, Bridgeton is likely to go somewhat slower. Uh, the whole escort will therefore have to go more slowly because it will, first of all, be weighed down with oil, uh, deeper draft, more risk of hitting a mine, so the escort will want to go slowly and carefully. The Pentagon says a Navy team has found seven mines in the same section of the Gulf where the Bridgeton hit that mine last week. And France is sending an aircraft carrier, plus several support ships, to the Persian Gulf region. ABC's Pierre Salinger was asked about the reasons for that move. The growing crisis between France and Iran uh, has contributed to this. Uh, one of the items that led to it was the hijacking of the Air Afrique plane uh, last Friday uh, on its way from Rome to Paris. The plane was taken to Geneva. A French citizen on the plane was killed. Uh, the plane was then taken over by uh, uh, Swiss authorities. The hijacker turned out to be a representative of the Hezbollah, and it is believed in high circles in France that it was the first retaliation against the French uh, for their decision to break diplomatic relations with Iran. No word of when the French ships will be leaving for the Persian Gulf region. 
Attorney General Ed Meese to be questioned to the Iran-Contra committees again today. He's certain to be asked about his handling of the initial investigation into the affair. Memorial service to be held soon for Commerce Secretary Malcolm Baldridge, who was killed in a freak radio rodeo accident over the weekend. That service to be held at the National Cathedral in Washington. President Reagan will deliver a eulogy this morning. Edward Woodward plays the equalizer on television. Now he's hospitalized in England after suffering a possible heart attack. Woodward is 57. In Fall River, Massachusetts, famous director John Houston reported to be in stable condition following uh, complications from emphysema. He will be 81 next week. For the ABC Information Network, I'm Doug Limerick. And we now hear a local newscast from July 29, 1987. This is Joy Gilmore. I'm Joy Gilmore with news from WLEA. A car was completely destroyed by fire on the Adrian Road below Adrian this morning. Canisteel firefighters were called at 722. Officials say preliminary investigation shows the car apparently hit a tree and went over the bank. Investigators have found no sign that anyone was in the car. They are still trying to determine what type of vehicle it is. The state's new Thruway Authority Chairman, William Hennessy, has fired Deputy Executive Director James Martin and Council Robert Farrell. Hennessy said he wants his own people in those jobs to deal with a number of serious matters affecting both the immediate and long-term operation of the authority. Martin has already filed a lawsuit to try to keep his job. He claims in the suit that he is being pushed out as a political vendetta by the governor because Martin supported New York City Mayor Ed Koch in the gubernatorial primary five years ago. The Rochester Democrat and Chronicle is running stories every day to make sure everyone in Monroe County is aware that the proposed no-smoking rules go into effect Saturday. The rules are almost the same as those proposed by the State Public Health Council, although the state's regulations are still in court. There will be no smoking permitted in Monroe County in any public place except for designated areas. The $6.3 billion Nine Mile Point Two nuclear power plant was restarted Monday night. A spokesman said the plant shut down Sunday because of mechanical problems and because of the unusually warm water temperatures, 77 degrees, in Lake Ontario. The lake water is used to cool some plant components and regulations do not allow the plant to operate when the lake reaches 77 degrees. That's news from WLEA, the News Authority in Hornell. Flash from the past there, Joy Gilmore from... Uh July 1987. Before that, we heard uh, Doug Limerick at ABC News. And, of course, the newsmaker for today was uh, Kevin Doran and Allegheny County historian Craig Brock, who's still the Allegheny County historian. I'm Brian O'Neill. Join us tomorrow for more Kevin Doran newsmaker shows. We're pulling out of our archives here at AM 1480 WLEA Hornell.